Hi, Brad and Jonathan. This is Rakesh here. I just have a quick question on emergency fund. With interest rates going low day by day or month by month, is it be okay to take a little bit risk and put, put the emergency fund in total bond market? Thank you. All right. Great. Great question. And I think a lot of it have it. So what I'm going to try to do is instead of telling you what to do with your emergency fund, you specifically in your financial case without knowing anything about it, I'm just going to talk about what my thoughts are about my emergency fund. So this is me telling you guys kind of what my mindset is for my stuff. And I hope you can extrapolate out. Maybe Brad can weigh in. There is no one answer on this, but with that in mind, let me, let me, let's talk about it. We have talked about the emergency several, several times, and we have a slightly, you know, contrarian perspective on that, I think even between both of us, and it's evolved over time as we've gotten a chance to get uh, feedback and information from Big Earn. I'll have an episode that we can link you guys to, and Brad will actually probably look that up now just to have the number early on. I think it was in the early 60s, Brad, but you can you can confirm that. And the, the thought is not, should you have an emergency fund or shouldn't you have an emergency fund? All of us need money to handle emergencies, but where should that be? And let me get, let me present to you the traditional problem that, that most of us grapple with, especially if you come in from the traditional personal finance space, a lot of people in this space say, all right, Hey, save up a thousand dollars, which is great. I, I totally agree with that. By the way, if you don't have a thousand dollars in cash, like, yes, we need to get our thousand dollars. But then the next step of that, all right, now you have your thousand dollars. Now I want you to save up three to six months of expenses in cash, three to six months. Of, most people never, yeah, most people never get past that point. They never start investing. They are perpetually in the three to six month. They never get the chance to see their money earn money for them. Uh, I've seen people push that to the point where they have multiple years of cash and they're sitting on 150,000, 200,000, some absurd amount of money in cash. Now it can serve different purposes, but if someone is specifically saying, I want to have a lot of money to handle emergencies, I think it's like really important for us to look at the opportunity cost that comes with that. Uh, and what is it that we're actually trying to protect ourselves against? So Brad, that's just like my framework. And we'll obviously dive into the nuance, the opportunity costs, and what maybe some solutions might be. Do you want to add any additional thoughts onto that so that I'm representing it correctly? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty good overview. Certainly I would say that just to reiterate as often and as loudly as humanly possible, nothing you're going to say is going to mean don't have an emergency fund, don't have money saved up. Most importantly, like you said, I, I think some people here don't have an emergency fund or maybe think a little bit differently with your emergency fund as saying, don't save money or don't have a net worth. Like nothing could be farther from the truth and what we're trying to say here. I think that is the most important thing. I hopefully people in the FI community are saving hundreds or thousands of dollars a month, right? And ultimately are going to get tens upon tens of thousands of dollars of net worth. And I think that is where this conversation, where, you know, your opinion is going to go here is from that place of strength, not from a place of weakness. And I think so much of the finance, the general financial advice is coming from a place of weakness that you have to constantly conserve, that you have to constantly like hold on to every last dollar as if it was going to vanish. Right. And you can't invest it. You have to have it squirreled away. And I think that's the part that is so interesting. Big Earn talked about that in episode 66. And Jonathan, you and I have actually talked about the emergency fund a lot recently. I think this is where the conversation is kind of pivoting for people in the FI community. Yeah. So I, you know, without like applying any like dogmatic rules, I think that most of us and whether or not we have a separate basket you know, for that we're calling our emergency fund or not, most of us will benefit from yes, having a thousand dollars in the bank. Yes. That's just you know, most of us have to start there because the, the norm is to just be able to pay off your minimum payments on your credit card each month. And so going from having minimum credit card payments being resolved to actually having a net positive, you know, net worth that's positive, even a thousand dollars is a big deal. Yes, we start there. I think that like for the person that wants to be able to create the space and simplify their finances, most people are going to benefit from being able to have anywhere from one month to two months of expenses in cash. This is more of a cash flow, you know, uh, play rather than rather than even calling it an emergency fund at this point. But if you do have one month extra buffer on top of your one month cash, that seems, 
you know, like that seems like pretty common sense. Some people, and it depends on what happens. It might be more, it might be a little bit less, but you're like, you know, it's one to two months of expenses. They handle this month's cash flow and have a little buffer on the other side. Now, when we're, we're talking beyond that, now we're talking about three to six months. Some people are really going for what they would call a fully funded emergency fund. I think this is where, in my mind, it gets controversial and where like my, what I would do would probably not line up with other people's direct choices. I have a net worth. I'm trying to have a significant net worth and I want to get as much money working for me as possible. Now, having said that, what is an emergency is something where it's unexpected and in a short period of time, you might need to be able to draw down on this money. Now, people have different categories for emergencies. For some people, a flat tire is an emergency. A $700 expense is a massive emergency. A $1,000 expense is a massive emergency. It's not an emergency for me anymore. So I've kind of like, it's just kind of worth pointing out that $1,000 does not make or break me in, in, in either way. Um, not to say I don't place a value in a thousand dollars. It just doesn't show up as an emergency anymore. And so if, if a thousand dollars is a crisis, then you've got to be a lot more conservative with, you know, your money. Cause you can't afford to not be able to cover that thousand dollar emergency. So there is a point at which as your net worth grows, you could afford to be a little bit more aggressive because you just have more space. Yeah, that's just kind of like, there's some nuance here and we do not know with PO box, like where they are at on the spectrum, but I hope that they're able to extrapolate this out. Now, assuming that they do have this hypothetical person, by the way, this hypothetical person has uh, a net worth, a thousand dollars doesn't really scare them. We got to think about what type, what is actually an emergency for us. And Brad, this is a, where I think you have in the past said, and I'll, and I'll let you share it. Like for me, what is a, what is kind of an emergency? Probably a, probably a car crash where my car is totaled and it's my fault. And there's like a, you know, five, $10,000 of unexpected expenses. That's starting to feel a lot like an emergency. That's starting to get more in the range for you. That's a bad week, but it's not, it's not even emergency at that point. Like, would you want to, what would be, what would actually be an emergency for you? Yeah. I mean, and this is not to say that, that bad things can't happen to me, obviously <laughs> that's, that's not what we're saying here, but for a financial emergency. Yeah. I mean, since big earn brought this to us, I, I have been trying to think of what would be that emergency that I would need to come up with cash in a hurry. And, and I really can't come up with it that I would need to have just liquid cash sitting around because I mean, frankly, just about everything can be paid for with a credit card. You have insurance for dramatic, dramatic situations, and you have assets that are invested. Like in my case, I have assets that are invested that I theoretically in a, in a true emergency could sell and then just transfer that money into my checking account. So, all right, so let's play this out. Let me, let me use yeah. you as a case study here, and then we'll scale it down for me. Cause you're as someone that is officially fine, it might not be quite as useful, but I think it's a place to start and we'll scale it down. So Brad Barrett with who is Fi. We don't need to get into specifics here, but who is, who is absolutely five by any standard, uh, has a $15,000 emergency. Now in parallel to that, because I think this is people, Brad Barrett has his money invested in the market. The market is March of 2020, right? The market is down 30, 40%. Brad Barrett has a $15,000 emergency. Like what? How does this play out? Is, is the, the fact that you did not have your cash in a savings account at that point, earning 0.045, has that proven that the idea of not necessarily having your emergency fund and savings account, a bad idea? Well, no, I mean, again, this is hypothetical, so it's impossible to know precisely the situation, but I would assume that that money that I have, instead of having it sitting there in a savings account, earning essentially nothing that I would have invested it over the course of many, many years. And that the march of the stock market, as we've seen over its history, has made that money grow significantly. And I have huge unrealized gains in that money. I may have invested $3,000 20 years ago, and it's doubled easily twice, right? So that $3,000 could be $12,000 right now or more, it could be the full 15 that you're talking about in this hypothetical, as opposed to if I had stuck that $3,000 in a savings account, quote unquote, right, earning virtually nothing, it would be maybe, I don't know, $3,100 if I'm lucky, right? So this is the concept, and I think this is critical, and this is why we're spending a lot of time on this, like the, that concept of the opportunity cost, right? What are you giving up, right? 
So that, that is, it, this is one of those fundamental concepts in life just to like living a better life is understanding opportunity cost. What by making a decision, I'm foregoing a whole host of other decisions. I'm foregoing other things that I could, when you go to college, you know, the opportunity cost of that is not only the tuition and, and fees and such, but it's the income that you could have earned at a job if you had started at 18, right? That's just a for, for example, but I think that's a pretty stark one that people can see that in their mind that the opportunity cost of college is not just what are you paying? It's that plus what could you have earned? Right. So, and I'm sure there are a host of other factors, but you know, that's, that's an interesting way. So the opportunity cost of, Hey, I want this money to be safe. I want that in my emergency fund, that 3000 bucks. Well, I would have foregone all that growth over my 20 year adult life, basically. So I think that's kind of uh, a cool way to look at this. So yeah, Jonathan, I, hopefully I answered your question there. All right. Yeah. So this is, this is really interesting. So Brad's an, Brad's answer is totally right. It's a huge point that people realize. Let's say you've put all of your money, you know, and let's say instead of, you know, saving inside of an emergency fund until you get to this fully funded amount, you start saving inside of some sort of investment vehicle. To Brad's point, that looks like dollar cost averaging. The market spends 90% of the time at or near the top. So the likelihood of you just dumping this massive amount on one day and then having it the next day, while there are clearly examples of that, it is, uh, that is a lot. What is way more common is that, you know, you invested money slowly over time. The market went up at whatever interval it did. And then if it were to crash again, Murphy crash, right. As you were to need the money that decline probably got it somewhere close in your worst case scenario to where it would have been if you had just kept it in the checking account, making 0.01%. And this is what Big Earn says. While it is possible that someone loses money, it's way more possible that they're losing money by, by not doing this. So let's kind of take Brad's example of someone that re, re, forget the market allocation or whatever. They're, they're going to be fine. A $15,000 emergency for me is a, it's a, it's, it would be, that would be problematic. We could resolve it. It'd be problematic. It would be uncomfortable. Uh, and I'd probably be scrambling for a couple months just to kind of figure out, you know, how are we going to, it's not, how are we going to cash flow this in the most optimized way possible? And here's how I'm kind of triaging it like in my mind. Um, first of all, my action, we do have, we keep a couple months, you know, just, just cash flow. And I don't, I don't think of it as an emergency fund. It's just there. So I don't have to go look and make sure I overdraft or anything else. Uh, there's a couple months of expenses. Absolutely there. And then you have your 401ks, which are obviously out of reach. And then you have your uh, taxable brokerage account. And inside the taxable brokerage account, you guys know that I'm a huge fan of M1 Finance. I actually allocate um, my pies there for different timelines, right? So long-term investments and then like a shorter timeline investment, which you could think of, I guess, as like an emergency fund. Over the long term, like the market in low-cost index fund is, is pretty predictable. But in the short term, that predictability uh, starts to look a lot more volatile. And the problem is, well, you, you know, to, to your point, the real thing is, what if you were to try to draw out right as the market were to go down? And so what I do is in this, in this shorter timeline investment fund that I kind of, you know, I recognize that this could be a, an alternative for my emergency fund. Um, I think about this much more the way that a, that, a, that a retiree would think about that money. You know, and so it's in terms of my asset allocation, instead of being like a hundred percent equities, a percentage of my money I've actually set up inside of this, this pie, this M1 pie. And I, I call it, I just named it my negative correlation pie. And this was really drawing from, uh, from Frank. The only thing that really scares me is that if I were to have this, if I were to have this 15 or $20,000 emergency that were to happen at the same time as some sort of, you know, uh, problem in the economy. And whether that be some sort of pandemic 2.0, 3.0, whether or not it be some sort of fiscal crisis, whether or not it be anything, something that right as I really need this money, you know, equities are tanking and I'm going to have to transfer this out while they're being suppressed. So for me, I don't care about stability as much. I want something that's negatively correlated to the stock market. And so my personal choice, not a recommendation, I've been exploring, what does it look like? What, what does negative correlation look like? And I've been experimenting around with a mixture of, um, of bonds, of precious metals, that sort of thing. Things that maybe, you know, if, if something, things that would have the potential to go in a different direction as the stock market. Now, I don't, I'm not an expert in this space. 
It's not something that I can speak it out with a lot of confidence, much like we just say, hey, if you just want to own the whole market, just buy VTSEX, I wouldn't feel comfortable making personal recommendations. But my thought was have a smaller pie that acts as an analog for my emergency fund and hopefully has some level of negative correlation with whatever is going on in the stock market. And that, that, that is kind of what I personally have made the choice to do. And Brad, I know you want to hop in, so I'll let you, but I do have one more slight little a hack that, that I think I figured out that I'd like to come back to on the other side. Uh, so just bookmarking my spot. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, uh, so that episode you mentioned with Frank, that was episode 194 and Jonathan, I'm not sure if you know this, but Frank has a podcast. Ooh. Uh, Frank is basically the smartest human we know. And yeah, he started a podcast a couple of months ago and actually didn't really even tell us about it, which is uh, <laughs> kind of sad. I would have loved to have talked about it on the podcast earlier in this. So it's called Risk Parity Radio, P-A-R-I-T-Y, Risk Parity Radio. And yeah, he goes through just a whole different host of uh, investing options. He talks about his portfolio and just, like you said, different asset classes to create a larger portfolio. So yeah, I mean, for those of you who are listening to our podcast and said, Hey, obviously I totally understand the simple path to wealth, but I personally would love to learn more. I'd love to see what the next level is. I, I suspect you'll really, really enjoy Frank's podcast. So yeah, Jonathan, you should check it out. Well, and what I love about the way Frank tackled it when he came on our show and you just referenced uh, 194, I believe. So choose slash 194, if you want to go listen to that, but was that Frank basically said he took a look at, uh, crashes that have happened over the last 20 or 30 years. Specifically, we have the 2008, uh, and then we have 2001. And he wanted to get negative correlation. He wanted to see a scenario where when the stocks and equities go down, something else goes up. That's what he was looking at. And for me, that's what I want for my emergency fund as well. Great. I have this long-term plan for growth, but man, if it were to tank, it'd be really nice to allocate my, you know, allocate in such a way that I could get a little ride on the other side. Now, Coming back to my little hack that ties it all together, that I think is like the best case scenario. Regardless of your asset allocation, regardless of your asset allocation, when you're using inside of your taxable brokerage account, something like M1 Finance, and you guys know, if you've listened to our show any period of time, we, I've raved about this. I don't need to tell you more on this other than go check out one of the, we did an episode recently with Brian Barnes, and you can go to choosefi.com slash M1 for a detailed write-up that we did on this. They actually give you access to a margin loan. And there, if you, they have an M1 plus, I think right now, when you sign up for it, you get like one year of their M1 plus for free. Their margin loan allows you to access up to 30% of your portfolio, uh, at, at rates as low as like 2%. So, you know, talking about that situation that Brad had is 15,000, $20,000 purchase, put it on the credit card. And then you're like, Oh, but I don't want to sell anything out of the stocks because stocks are going down or whatever. What I would do to get that off the credit card ASAP. I would take the credit card. You got what, 45 days, Brad, of basically interest-free on the credit card with this emergency. Towards the end of that, I would then take the margin loan off of you know, M1 Finance, which is now taking that interest, which is free, and now about to go to 25, 26%. And then I would have a 2% interest rate with this M1 uh, margin loan. I would pay that off, and then I would be making payments back to M1 in the balance while watching to see what goes on with the market. If the market is recovering, great. If the negative correlation is taking place, great. Use that to then pay off the balance and some, you know, or some, some combination, you know, thereof. But that is like my little hack to not get freaked out, to feel like I have some agency in the game, to not be keeping 50, 60, a hundred, $200,000 in a savings account, making 0.01. And look, this is my biggest problem with this. People are like, I, I can't map this out. We're going to have big earn come on and tell us how serious this is. But with the quantitative easing that's happened over the last couple of years, the money supply has been close to doubled in the last decade. Like it's been, it's 25% of all the money in the United States history was uh, put into the economy over the last 12 months. And with the last two or three rounds of stimulus checks, I heard numbers that it was closer to 30, 35, 40%. So you, and, and to tie this back to like, you know, the early 1900s, you know, uh, it, it, the, your purchasing power is guaranteed to go down over time if it's in a coffee can. So just having the money there sitting, doing nothing is not without its own level of risk. Going much deeper than that would require a conversation that's above my pay grade. I'm happy to like bring the experts on to talk about it, but I'm telling you that I'm not happy with just the coffee can approach. It doesn't, doesn't work for me. So that is like how I try to mitigate the risk to feel comfortable with it and try to get my money working for me. Great. If the savings account wants to give me a great interest rate, I'm going to use that. 
As soon as they stop, I'm going to get mercenary and figure out where else I can get a return. That's basically where I land.